En welkom allemaal. We hebben vanavond een uh, lezing van uh, Dr. Nick Nikolski. Um, en het gaat over parabels in de Joodse, uh, in de Rabbijnse Midrash. Ronit uh, doet al lang onderzoek en, uh, en dossiert ook over uh, uh, religie, over cultuur, uh, proces, cognitieprocessen, uh, uh, emoties in de, in de tekst ook. Ze zal het beter uitleggen zo meteen. Uh, wel in het Engels, ze, ze begrijpt me, neem ik aan. <laughs> Weet ik wel. Uh, de lezing is in, is in het Engels. Um, voor ons, we zijn met een uh, Midrash uh, studiegroep bezig um, en het is fascinerend om een verbinding te maken met de mensen van, uh, van, van de oudheid. Dus op één niveau de tekst, maar hun cognitie, hoe dachten ze? Wat waren dat voor mensen? Misschien zullen we wat, uh, wat hints krijgen hoe, over hun denkprocessen. Dus ik ben heel blij dat uh, Ronit uh, heeft ja gezegd om uh, de lezing te geven. En uh, in het Engels zeggen, without further ado, <laughs> the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jaco, for the nice uh, introduction. Um, so I will speak uh, in English, but I understand Dutch. So If you want to uh, ask me anything in Dutch, uh, you don't have to translate yourselves into English. Hopefully I will uh, understand that. Uh, I've been living here for uh, quite a few years and I've been teaching at the university, but I was doing it in English all the time. So I'm, I'm used to, to lecture in English. Um, I'm I am teaching in the Middle East Studies Department in the Groningen University and in the, the program which is called Culture and Cognition. And I will speak a little bit about this, but this is always at the background of what I'm doing. This is my uh, theoretical background. So culture and cognition, and uh, which is connected to evolution. And this will come up in the lecture as well. Uh, so I put links to the texts that we are going to read uh, in the chat and you are welcome to look at them when we are reading them uh, so you can see the text as well. And uh, please stop me if you don't understand what I'm saying. Yeah, so for questions are best in, in, in the end, but if you don't understand what I'm saying, then uh, please stop me so that I can uh, explain what I'm saying. <laughs> All right, I will now uh, share my screen. Okay, so uh, parables in uh, rabbinic culture or in rabbinic midrash per se. So what are parables? There are a lot of um, expressions that are sort of close and similar. So I want to um, channel our mutual understanding a little bit. Uh, so, for example, uh, in many cases they talk in, in the, the science of, of literature about the difference between a simile and a metaphor. Yes, you have an example here. Uh, in, in both a simile, a simile and a metaphor, one thing is compared to the other. But... Um, The, the difference that they put here on, on this uh, slide uh, gives a very technical difference. So then in the CMIL you say, uh, you use a compar comparison word like something or as cool as uh, something. And in the metaphor, you don't use a compar comparative word. And this is the difference in the literary sciences, but the difference is deeper than just this little technical thing. Because if you are saying that something is like something, you already know that you have to um, keep two things in your mind. You are being instructed to do it. And in the metaphor, it's a little bit a thing that you have to do on your own. Uh, and do you do it or not? This is a little bit a matter of uh, education, etc. Yeah, so the, the, it doesn't really matter what is what at the moment. I just want to 
present the fact that this thing is complex, these uh, comparisons are complex, and it takes uh, a lot of thinking about what, what are they exactly, and indeed the, it, it, people did think about it a lot uh, and theorize this, uh, this issue of change. For example, uh, these two people that you see here, very famous uh, book about the way we think, uh, which is uh, yeah, Gil Fokoye and Mark Turner, they coined this concept which is called conceptual blending that talks about the issue of comparison and saying that it's, it's a blending. Yeah, you have to blend two concepts in your mind in order to create a third one. And they also have this complex uh, scheme that they put out in their book where you start in a generic space and there are two inputs, input one, input two, and you blend them together and then you get a third thing. So this is uh, just to, to give you a taste that this issue is complex. Yeah? So if we compare, uh, if we put together the, the concept of land and the concept of mother, and we get the, the third concept, the, the blending of motherland, uh, it already has a, a meaning that is different from the two first concepts, but it's, it has um, aspects of each of them imaginary aspects or or or, or uh, emotional aspects and, and yeah so it, it's 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 a complex thing so in a similar manner they make the distinction for ex between allegory and parable so we know what allegory is this the book lord of the flies uh, if if you know I, I don't know when i was young i was it was very very famous or the 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 fable about the hare and the tortoise so these are stories that are, they don't tell you that, that they mean more than what they are. Yeah, as opposed to parables that do tell you. But in any case, these are complete stories. Yeah? It's not like one word or one concept that we are comparing, but it's a complete story which is being compared in our mind to, to another complete story. A story is... Um, of course, it always has a, a protagonist, yeah, a person or a personized uh, animal who is going through processes. Yeah, so there's a, a protagonist and a plot. And of course, uh, there are a lot of uh, theories of what exactly a story is. This is also being theorized very seriously. But it, it is creating, a story is creating our storied uh, reality. When we talk about the storied reality, it means that it's possible to have other realities as well, and we do. And this is uh, what they talk about when they talk about culture and cognition. Yeah, what kind of culture does the human brain create at any moment? Uh, and also, what was the evolution of this? Yeah, in what stage or why are we different? Why human culture is different from the culture of other animals? And that's where the cognition is, it becomes really important. And the evolutionary aspect means that it, the, the, the way the, the culture develops, the human culture develops, is it's sort of that it builds one on top of the other, like natural evolution, uh, where they take one aspect of the previous one and then develop it so severely, I mean, so strongly, that it, it is already not the thing that it was before. Yeah, so it, it it, it builds one on, on top of the other, but it really changes. So th it, this, the, the, the study of cultural evolution, yeah, and cognitive cultural evolution, talks about how cultures change. And one of the ways of, of changings, changing for human culture was to, to learn to create stories, yeah, which means that stories are not there in their reality, but they are the way that we humans decide to perceive reality. Yeah, to talk about why things happened, what is, um, how do the people in the story feel? Yeah, and we get a lot of um, um, engagement with this type of story. And uh, he, th this book that I put here is uh, the theory that I'm just talking about is uh, from this person whose name is, whose name is uh, Merlin Donald. He, he wrote this really nice and interesting book, which is called Origin of the Modern Mind, which talk about these things that I just um, told you about. 
Okay, so this is a little bit of a general introduction. Now I want to um, yeah, focus in uh, rabbinic culture. Perhaps you know this, so it's just a, a, a review in this, and I'm, I'll do it very shortly. So first of all, we have within rabbinic culture, which is basically belongs to the first uh, millennium. Yeah, after this, it's already post uh, medieval culture, so it's, it's 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 a bit different. But this particular culture that I'm working on is of the first millennium, so that we have a a, a temporal distinction. Uh, between the early, which is called Tanaitic, uh, until the year 250, dates are very blurred there. And then there's the, the classical, the Amoraic uh, 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 rabbinic um, culture or yeah, period. And then there's the post Amoraic, of course. So the, that's a temporal distinction. Then we have a cognitive distinction. Usually people call it a, a, a distinction in genre, but I, I because I'm doing cultural uh, cognition, I'm talking about a cognitive uh, division, which is between midrash, which is storied, and halacha, which is that typical thing of rabbinic culture, which is actually not storied. Yeah, the, this is actually the the core of it is thematic legal. Uh, um, uh, explanation. Yeah, so it's not necessarily a story. Of course, they have a lot of stories in in their in their text, but the 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 way of organizing reality is not a storied reality. So in this respect, it's a little bit of development from the storied reality um, stage of the culture. And then there's also a division, a geographic division between the Palestinian uh, rabbinic culture and the Babylonian rabbinic, rabbinic culture. Well, the Palestinian was, of course, the original, uh, and the Babylonian one developed in the area of Iraq, more or less from where we know the Babylonian Talmud, but there's also a Jerusalem Talmud, less people know about that one. Um, and uh, in, in the end, the kind of Judaism that we have today is mostly, in fact, Babylonian. Yeah, it's mostly influenced by the Babylonian Talmud, and the Palestinian rabbinic culture sort of got lost uh, it, yeah, it moved um, after Islam came into Palestine, it moved into Europe, and in Europe it sort of gave in into the uh, Babylonian culture, which was stronger. So anyway, that's a gen in general lines, the, the history of rabbinic culture, and then we have uh, the plan of the lecture is some theoretical introduction, some historical introduction, and these two we did already, yeah, so we are done there. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about Rabbinic Midrash, because this would be um, the, the stepping stone for the parables. Uh, and this is the place where the rabbis were able to make cultural change. Yeah, And it's important to make cultural change, and we can talk about why, why it is important uh, a bit later. Then I will focus on parables and their role in cultural change. And then we will look into some parables and you have the links to the text already um, in the chat. Uh, I'm making a little break, so if anyone wants to ask anything at this point, you're welcome, then we will do a little recap. So, um, I have a me, question. Yes. Of course. So, um, is it, is it, is there a clear distinction mm -hmm. In the language of those different periods, the Tanaim, the Tanaitic, the Amoraic, and what comes later. What do you mean in language? In 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 the language, in the language yeah, yes. that, that they are writing, and in the way that they are expressing themselves. Yeah, uh, there there is uh, there is a linguistic difference. Yeah, people who study the Hebrew language can tell you this is rabbinic language of the earlier period, and that's for of the later. Uh, it's, there's also difference that uh, some texts are in Aramaic, uh, and actually these are the classical ones, yeah, the Babylonian Talmud, the Palestinian Talmud, and a lot of the Midrash, the Amoraic, the Middle Period. It is in Aramaic because this um, this is uh, yeah, the, the, the literary output of a, a, a society that spoke Aramaic, and later it sort of came back to Hebrew. Yeah, so there was kind of a revival. So there is a, a difference in language. There is a difference in the type of, of Hebrew. 
in, in these periods. Yeah? So Mishnaic, the early period is similar, more similar to biblical, but already different from it, etc. Yes, there Thank is you. a distinction. Thanks. Uh, all right, so um, uh, about Midrash, this, you don't have the text of this because I think that's big enough and you can see. Um, in many cases, people say that the Midrash is commentary on the Bible uh, and that it always uh, hooks on, uh, there's always a, a, a linguistic problem, a language problem that it is trying to solve. I, I want to show here that this is not so simple to say it in this way. So uh, let's look at this example. And God called the light day and the darkness night. Yeah, that's Genesis, all right? They created uh, and distinguished between the light and the darkness. Um, so this is the verse. Yeah, we always start with a verse because rabbinic culture is, like Christian culture, claims to be based on the Bible. I, I mean, claims, when I say claims, it's not that it's not based. It is based, but it it always adapts the Bible to its own time. Otherwise, the Bible becomes irrelevant. The same, so here, this is the verse that we are going to have a Midrash about. And this is the Midrash. Uh, Rabbi Elazar says, God never attaches his, his name to bad things, only to good things. It doesn't say, and God called the light day and the darkness God called night. It doesn't say this. But it says, and the darkness, night. So what's happening here? Yeah, if we look back at the verse, we see that in the second part, yeah, in the second line, it doesn't say, and God called the darkness, night. No, it doesn't repeat the word of God, and it doesn't say that God called it. Yeah. So, And the Midrash is sort of picking on this point. Yeah. So originally, the verse doesn't need it. Yeah, we understand very well, of course, uh, it's the same subject of the and the verb works for both parts of the of the of of the end of the sentence, but the rabbis sort of pick on this point, and they say something else. And what they say is God never attaches His name to bad things, as you can see from this verse. Now the verse didn't say that. The verse had other things in mind. Yeah. So here we see that the midrash is putting its own ideology into the verse. Rabbis wanted to say that God doesn't attach himself to bad things. Maybe they were fighting against the Rastians. Maybe they were, I don't know, what, what, uh, Gnostics. Whatever that was there at the moment, it was important for them to say this thing. And they hook on the verse, they use the biblical verse in order to tell us their ideology. All right, that's very typical. This is why Midrash is not commentary, but it is... Um, um, the inclusion of the Bible into the culture, which is now a bit newer and different from the Bible. Yeah, this is this is cultural evolution. Yeah, it it pretends to be commentary, but in fact, it it just it means yeah we have moved in our culture and we are taking the Bible with us by saying that whatever we think is in the Bible. Yeah, so uh, it. it what we see is scholars of this is a little bit different from what the thing itself is presenting itself to be. Okay, so uh, that's Midrash. Now we have this as a, uh, as a, as a basis. And uh, we move to the next question, which is, yeah, so as you saw, Midrash is a story about a story. So why to tell a story about a story? I actually already gave you the answer to this. It is cultural evolution, but why a story? And here I want to, uh, it, I, it's an example from ancient Mesopotamia that has nothing to do with, uh, with, with the rabbis or with the Bible or with anything. It's, it's ancient uh, Near East. Um, so here we have just one little line from there. Uh, which gives us here the, the rule about stealing and receiving stolen property and kidnapping. And you see that it is formulated in a store, in, in, a, in a form of a story. If a man breaks into a house, they shall kill him and hang him in front of the very breach, yeah, the, the place that he sinned. Why does it do this? Because we are 
with our um, cognition, which is creating stories, more engaged with things that are stories. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot, a lot of uh, theory about it, about uh, the, uh, this type of cognition that creates a story, and I will not go into it from a cultural evolutionary perspective, but because stories, but just a little bit, I will, a little bit, just because stories are about people that things are happening to them, we can identify it and then we can have empathy. Yeah, we can, we can feel it the same and then we are engaged because it's in our body, we, we are feeling this. So to have a story about a story is very, is more important than to say, as you say, let's say in academic work, you say, yeah, we, the Bible uh, didn't didn't care about whether God attaches his name to a good thing or a bad thing, but the rabbis did, so they changed the story. Yeah, this would be less interesting than telling the story itself. So it is to create this type of uh, engagement. All right, let's go into parables. Uh, and here I must say, so there are a lot of parables in the early rabbinic literature. Of course, there are also a lot of parables in the, in the New Testament. And many scholars worked seriously on the question, yeah, of course, checking whether the parables of Jesus are of Jewish origin. Are they similar to those of the rabbis? Are they not similar to those of the rabbis? And there was a lot of really interesting work um, being put into it. Uh, one of them is this uh, Daniel Boyarin in his book, uh, Intertextuality and the Reading of Midrash, uh, really a wonderful book, quite old already. I think it's from the 80s. And he talked about the difference between the, the rabbinic parable and the parables of Jesus. He says in the Gospels, there, Jesus is telling a parable when he cannot tell the thing itself. Yeah? Because the thing itself is about God, is about things that he he there are mysterious. So it's because he cannot say it, he tells a parable. That's we are in theory. In the Midrash, it is a complete opposite. You have the biblical text. You know what the end of the story is going to be already. Everything is completely clear. So the parable is, is doing something else. And what it is doing is this evolutionary upgrading of the culture and keeping the old text, the Bible, still relevant. It's the way to keep the Bible relevant and be able to continue. And here I just brought you two exam examples of two other books. Uh, David Flusser, maybe some of you know him, did a lot of work on the comparing the rabbinic and the New Testament parables. And also Brad Young, he actually is a student of uh, David Flusser, who worked on this as well. And now I want to be more practical and go into the structure of a rabbinic parable. So because it is, a, the parable would always hook itself on a midrash that is hooked on a verse. So this would be the structure. First of all, we get the verse, then we get the midrash, then we get the parable about the midrash, and then we get the, sometimes we get the explication, yeah, the, the explanation, um, uh, the final one, but we will not, which is l less interesting at the moment, and I will not go into it here at all. All right, any questions at this point? All right, so this is the first parable that we are going to read. This is from this book, Parables in Changing Context, which is a collections, collection of essays uh, that were done uh, in a project that was very, very important that took place in mainly in Utrecht and the Catholic University um, by Eric Ottenheim and Marcel Porthaus. Maybe you know them. Uh, they had, they and also um, one other person, Annette Mertz, they had a, a, a long, a few years project that was very important about the uh, early Christian and early rabbinic parables. Um, working on both of them and trying to find the, 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 the habitus, the milieu, the, the cultural uh, background of, of both um, uh, from the point of view that they thought it was, it is the same. It, it is the same, I also think so. And it was a great project because they brought in many people, they incorporated, so it, in a way they put, put the study of parables again on the uh, scholarly map 
uh, after uh, uh, Flusser and Brad Young. Uh, so uh, it was a very important project. So th this parable is from this book. And it is the priest and the two wives. Um, so and you have a link to the to the text. Um, but I don't see that any of you are there. If you if you press the link, do, do you still see the parable there on the? Yeah, yeah. Well, on a big screen, it's actually I can read it. But on a small screen, they you can go to the link if you want. Yes. OK. All right, so you are all welcome to 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 um, to press the link and uh, go to the parable. The link is in the chat again, so that everyone knows. Okay, so I'm I'm reading the parable. Yes, okay, I see that people are coming in. Good. Um, so the the parable has to do with the book of Leviticus. The the the, the text has to do with the book of Leviticus. It's, a, it's a, from a Midrash about uh, Leviticus and about the verse in Leviticus 5.21, as you can see there. If any soul sins and commits a trespass against the Lord and deal falsely with his neighbor in a matter of deposit or of pledge or of robbery or have oppressed his neighbor and et cetera, et cetera, it goes on into the, what the rule is. For our purpose, it doesn't matter what the rule is because the Midrash is going to work not on the rule, but actually on the first few words, if any soul sin. Yeah, what does it mean that the soul sins? I'm reading the, 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 the green part now, yeah, the Midrash. Uh, the Holy One, blessed be he, said to the soul, why did you sin before me? It will say before him, yeah, that's in, uh, when it comes to, to, the, to its final judgment. It will say, it, the soul, will say before him, Master of the universe, I did not sin. It was the body that sinned. Since I departed from it, I'm like a pure bird flying in the air. In what way have I sinned before you? He, God, will say to the body, why did you sin before me? It, the body, will say before him, Master of the universe, it is not I who sinned. The soul sinned. Since it departed from me, I am cast like a stone cast onto the ground. Could I have sinned before you? Okay, so here they tell a little this uh, nice story uh, of the soul and the body talking to God. Um, God blamed each of them and they both claim to be pure. I didn't do the sin and uh, etc. Um, and this is the Midrash. Yeah. So, uh, and the the problem is, of course, the biblical the biblical language when it uh, when it says if a soul sin, it doesn't mean that the soul sin. It just means that a person. Yes, the soul is just another word for a person. But the midrash picked on this word and went into a theological question: Who is the sinner in the form of a person? Yeah. If if, if a person says, who sins there? Is it the body or is it the soul? Which is an interesting question. We will not go into it because at a later stage, then there is a parable about this theological discussion and it solves the problem. And the parable goes like uh, the following. Uh, Rabbi Chia uh, taught, this is analogous to a priest who had two wives. So, yeah, see, saying this is analogous means this is a par yeah, this is comparable. Yeah, so not, we know that now he's going to tell us a parable. So this is analogous to a priest who had two wives. One, the daughter of a priest, and one, the daughter of an Israelite. Yeah, so, so the, the Israelite nation was made of priests that were serving in the temple and there were families and they had children and a daughter, yeah. So this is a daughter from a priestly family. And one was a daughter of a non-priestly family, a simple, normal family. So he, the priest, uh, gave them truma, the dough, a special dough for the for the temple, uh, to prepare uh, the food for the for the, the, the bread to to sacrifice at the temple, and they rendered it impure. Yeah, so all kinds of way that the um, things have to be that are given to the temple have to be prepared in a special way, etc. But these two women, they made it impure, so it could not be used. 
he said to them, the priest to his wives, who rendered the, the dough impure? This one says, that one impurified it. And that one says, this one impurified it. What did the priest do? And so the two women were blaming each other. Okay, that's uh, expected. What did the priest do? He executed the daughter of the Israelite and began taking to task the daughter of the uh, priest. He excused. Uh, yeah, 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 excused, sorry, yeah. He excused the daughter of the Israelite and started to, uh, and began taking task to the daughter of the priest. Yeah, so the Israelite uh, wife, he says, okay, fine, whatever, whatever. And the priestly wife, he started um, reproaching her. She said to him, my lord, the priest, why did you excuse the daughter of the Israelite and take him me to task? Did you not give it to both of us together? Yeah, it makes sense to ask this. Why did you, why do you punish me and not her? He said to her, she is the daughter of the Israelite and is not accustomed to her father's house. But you are a daughter of a priest and you are accustomed to your father's house. That is why I'm executing, uh, excusing the daughter of the Israelite and taking you to task. All right, so now we know it is the soul's, the soul's fault that they sinned. Okay, the one who is more holy, she should have known better. All right. So this is a nice parable. It's a nice midrash, and it is most important that you see for, for my for for a lecture about parables that you see that the parable is talking not directly about the biblical verse, but already about the, how the rabbis understood the biblical text. Yeah. yeah. So we see the ratcheting of culture one on top of the other, like an onion. Yeah. So. <coughs> Can All right. I, can I insert a comment? Sure, sure. Because 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 we are busy with midrash from from, and we're doing actually also what you what you refer to bringing bringing Bible verses to the present. Yeah. So there there are some terms like those two. We learned that you have nefesh de tuma and nefesh de kedusha. That you that you have two parts of the soul. So this this echoes in this story as well. Just a small comment. Yeah, I wonder if the if the if the Kabbalists were using this uh, midrash of the two wives or the parable. Kabbalist ha Hasidim, it's it's in various this this the the the, the story about the the slave girl that inherited her master, uh, the, the wife. Eh? She, yeah. Uh, this you see this this uh, and, and, and it's a kind of symbol mostly when they're talking about an, a, a daughter and another a two women it's mostly soul neshama yes it's connected okay I yeah will... as if as a, as a type of topos in many cases uh, women serve as the soul that's true all right the next um, parable is this one Again, from a book by Liefhe Teuchels. Yeah, she's a, a, a Dutch scholar of, of Jewish studies, a very good one. And she made an edition of all the, the, the parables of the Tanaitic, uh, one, Tanaitic period. She wants to do a whole series of them. And I took this one from uh, her book. Okay, I'm reading it. I hope it's uh, clear to everyone. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Yeah, so if you remember um, when, when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush and he was talking and talking and talking for a long time about um, sending him and then Moses says, you know, I don't want to go. Yeah? So God was angry. This is when the, what, where the verse is coming from. And here is the, in, the, in the yellow is the Midrash there. The Holy One, blessed be he, pressed Moses for six days and on the seventh day, he said to him, Moses said to him, make someone else your agent. Okay, make someone else your agent. And then God, God was angry. And uh, let's see what the parable is doing here. So the parable. They tell this parable. To what is this matter similar? Yes, yeah, so this is a very formulaic uh, way of starting a parable. To a king who had a slave, and he loved him with a complete love. 
and the king sought to make him the slave his administrator to take care of the maintenance of the members of the king's palace yes the boss of everyone else in the palace what did the king do he took the slave by the hand and brought him into the treasury and showed him silver vessels and golden vessels fine stones and gems and all that he had in his treasury after this he brought him outside and showed him trees gardens orchards and enclosed area yeah, whatever that means, and all that he had in the fields. Afterwards, the slave closed his hand and said, I cannot be made administrator to take care of the maintenance of the members of the king's palace. The king told him, if you could not be made administrator, why did you put me through all this trouble? Why did you let me speak for so long? And the king was angry at him and decreed over him that he should not enter his palace. Yeah, what does it mean that he should not enter his palace? When we think about the biblical context, Moses didn't enter the promised land. Yeah, that's what it is referring to. Yeah, so it's a very cruel thing <laughs> that God did to Moses. Yeah, and, uh, and here they give the reason is not because of the sin of the water from the rock, but because of this refusal of Moses to be God's messenger, actually. Um, so what do we have here? Yeah, so we have a biblical story in which God is making a lot of effort, but he's God. And Moses is a person who have, has problems speaking and he's... Um, uh, ha had already problems in Egypt and uh, like legal problems. He killed someone, etc. And he was running in the desert and he was a shepherd now. Yeah, really, uh, like not, not spiritual shepherd, just a shepherd. And he doesn't want to be a leader. And then God is very angry at him and he punishes him. God didn't know Moses. It, it seems like an unfair, unfair story. But the parable reframes the whole thing in a way that we see um, we are still, you know, a king and a slave. It's not that Moses becomes uh, more important, but we see that it's a very emotional thing and we sort of can have sympathy with the king who was working so hard to try to convince someone he loved to do something that he thought was going to make him happy and then he gets, uh, you know, a cold sh uh, shoulder as it's called, yeah? So what we see here is that the parable is what I call emotional translation. Does an emotional, we, we, we frame the story differently. Yeah, we look at the whole scene with, uh, with empathic eyes. We, we see, we, we pity God. Yeah, so we, we feel for God at this point and um, it doesn't change the story, but it does a little bit uh, make us less bitter. Yeah, if we dare to be bitter about uh, the biblical story. This is very, very, very common in rabbinic culture to have this role for parables, yeah, to, to re, um, reframe our emotions. And a anyone who's doing a, a sermon in church or, or in a synagogue know, knows to do this. Yeah, we, we also do this all the time. So th we see this here uh, to... Um, keep the Bible with us and to look at it favorably. Yeah, so if we, if we want the, 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 our congregation, yeah, our people to, to keep being engaged with this book, then we have to, uh, to frame it in this way. And there are some, there are some, some, some uh, Bible heroes that are really lend themselves to the emotional aspect, like you say, which are basically, you can look at them as a villain, but there is sympathy to them, <laughs> like Esav. Yes. Everyone, when we were talking about Midrash and Esav, everyone had an enormous sympathy, you know? It's, it's a tragical kind, and then you can build, you can build an emotional narrative. Okay, exactly. Sorry, I'm... I'm, dist I'm <laughs> No, it's, it could be a nice thing to, 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 to try to compose Midrash about Esav that would uh, 
express th this type of emotion that we have toward him. Yeah, it's a good idea. All right, third and last one from another book. Um, this is my first article on, uh, on Midrash that talked about this kind of emotional translation. It was for a birthday, oh no, 60th um, um, yeah, anniversary of a uh, birthday of a friend of mine who was, who was a professor in Berlin. Now she's on pension. Um, and this was actually the first time that I wrote about uh, parables. And then I sort of joined uh, the Utrecht uh, group as a, as a guest. Okay, so this is from this book. And this is uh, the parable of the cow and its calf. And you have a link to that as well. Um, this one is from a much later, much later, yeah, much later rabbinic source, um, which is um, where it's it's uh, it, it's called the Tanhumaic corpus. Never mind that, but it is from the last period of where where the Jewish culture was still in the land of Israel, and it was on the way out, um, and out uh, into uh, into Europe. Um, so um, a lot of this corpus comes out of Italy, uh, which is the more or less the first place that the Jews moved uh, when they're uh, on the way out. And it, it sort of coincides with the uh, uh, entry of Islam into the land of Israel, but not uh, it, it's not because of that. Yeah, it sort of coincides uh, uh, temporarily. All right, <clears throat> no history now, uh, the parable. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt. Yeah, remember the brothers, they were angry with him. They, uh, they put him in a, in a well, in a, in a, in a whatever, and then they sold him to some uh, merchants that went to Egypt. And so Joseph was brought to Egypt. And uh, yeah, if you um, remember the biblical story, um, actually, all the Israelites then moved to Egypt. All the Israelites were Jacob and his sons. Yeah, these were all the Israelites. Um, and they moved to Egypt later too because Moses was there. Yeah, so uh, he, he brought them later on. And then they became a, a big nation there and the slaves of the Egyptians. And then there was the salvation when they were brought out of Egypt, and which is a foundational uh, story in, in, in the Bible and in, in the history of, of the biblical uh, nation. So this is the context. So it started off by Joseph being brought to Egypt because his brothers didn't like him. All right, so uh, the Midrash, the yellow. When the Holy One, blessed be he, wants to execute something, he uses a messenger. Yeah, this is clear, but it is rabbinic literature, so they have to bring a verse that proves their point. And so here they bring a verse, as it says, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly. Yeah, like the fly, the God calls the fly and the fly does the job. Uh, as well as through wasps, it happens with wasps, with frogs, you know, in Egypt uh, and, and other animals. So understand, yeah, the Midrash is telling you, that when he wanted to make happen the decree and what is the decree? Know that your seed shall be a foreigner in the land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. When God wanted this to execute, execute this, and I'll go back to what this is in a moment, he used the lesser of the tribes, which is Joseph, he's the youngest at the time, and as his messenger. First, Joseph was sold to Egypt, and then Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt to pay the debt. This is why it says Joseph was brought to Egypt, because he made his father and the tribes, the brothers, the twelve, go uh, down to Egypt. Yeah, so if, if you remember, God promised, already promised to Abraham that the Israelites would be in Egypt. Yeah, so this is, it's not a surprise that they are there. This was actually God's why did he do it? We don't know, but he promised to Abraham that his people will be in Egypt and then they will be saved from yeah? Then he will uh, take them out after 400 years. So now God has to execute this. So how does he do this? He brings Joseph to Egypt and 
following Joseph uh, come all of the other, uh, his father and uh, the whole family. All right, so this is clear. Theologically, we are clean. However, again, emotionally, you know, what kind of God is this? <laughs> What's happening here? Why, why is this thing necessary? We don't know. We have a parable to help us a little bit to become more, um, we'll see in a moment when we read this, a parable. Yeah. This is similar to a cow which one wants to yoke. And she was avoiding it, you know, to yoke, to, to, they used to plow with cows. So she was avoiding it. What did they do? They took her son from her and pulled him to the place where they wanted to plow. The calf was mooing, that's the voice, and the cow followed him to her disadvantage. This is a real tragic story that we see here. Yeah, a cow, they were taking the, the, the calf and she was following and then they yoked her. Now, does it make anything less uh, cruel? Not really. However, the whole atmosphere now is, is, is emotional. It's full of motherly emotions. And we are still criticizing God, but very uh, uh, latently, yeah, very uh, secretly. Well, while we are emotionally in a, in, in, in a motherly atmosphere, very typical for, for rabbinic midrash. It, it, so it doesn't really explain anything, but it puts the congregation or the, the audience of the parable in, a, in an emotional state, which, which is a good place, in a good emotional place. Yeah, so this parable is really um, nice in the fact that it doesn't solve, of course, not, not any linguistic problem, and it doesn't um, cr make the reality better. But it does create, of course, engagement because of the emotionality. Um, and it does allow the culture, yeah, the rabbinic culture, the synagogue, everyone is standing there and listening to or sitting and listening to this sermon and the parable is in the sermon. Um, a congregation that is, uh, it's pain, the, the people that are hearing this are not already in their, in their motherland, they are in, in Italy. Yeah, so they already miss their, their, the country of origin and why were they brought there? There's no solution. But there is a lot of containment to these emotions. Yeah? So in a way, being critical of God in a non-critical way. Yeah? That's you it. See, you see, I, I will just add, because I cannot control myself, as you know. <laughs> I will just add that there is an idea here immediately, which you see, and that is animals as messengers, as angels. Because because messenger and angel is an is a is a parallel concept later. Chayot, yeah, the, the same word for both. In Chayot, it. exactly. So so this 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 it, there is a question: What came first? <laughs> <laughs> With in which mind did it come first? But anyway, it's a beautiful wow. idea. The 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 animals as messengers that are fulfilling their mission. And they cannot move left or right, but they do what they must do. And you yes. see it here, if you in want. The, in their animalistic way, which is nonverbal and therefore emotional. Absolutely. Yeah. Very nice. All right. This is basically the end. <laughs> uh, so, first of all, you see that the academic approach, I'm academic approach, it's not only brainy. We are doing what we're doing because we are actually emotional about it. Yeah, it's not, it doesn't come out in the articles maybe, but we know that we work on it. What we did is we went through a little bit in a theoretical introduction about comparing things. Remember the, the, the simile and the metaphor and the allegory, etc. Uh, talked about storied reality and it's um, as, as a cognitive strategy that humans create in their culture, about culture and cognition about uh, parables, New Testament rabbinic, and the, the structure of the rabbinic, uh, rabbinic parables. Short historical overview of rabbinic literature, very short. And then the uh, Midrash, 
and parables, how they serve and how they ratchet one on top of the other. And then we looked at some parables. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, yeah, please, any questions, I'll be happy to answer. If there's no other questions, it's your chance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, no, I I would like then uh, to uh, to thank you, uh, Ronit, for a thank wonderful you. wonderful lecture. Really enjoyed it. It, it, it. There were also some ideas that I think uh, we recognized from what we do. We look mostly at the midrash from the 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 Hasidic, Hasidic, uh, the tradition of the Hasidim and the Kabbalah, yes. and looking mostly at what it means in terms of uh, of uh, internal processes in the in the man, in men in the human soul in the human uh, mind, um, and you can see how ideas start to grow, like like the angels, animals, and and the um, two ladies that represent the soul. So thank you very much. Maybe I will ask you again <laughs> to talk about some specific issue uh, in the future. Uh, thank you everyone for your, uh, for your time, for uh, coming together and for the questions. And uh, until uh, next time. Yeah, thank you for me too, for, uh, for everyone for, um, for coming here and listening to me. Um, I really appreciate that. And thank okay. you, Jacob, for inviting me.